the scripture speaks clearly of there will be some, there will be this Jewish temple, a third temple on the Temple Mount in the final days. And this desecration that they're talking about from the Antichrist, that's going to occur midway in the tribulation. So after three and a half years, the Antichrist, who originally people thought, hey, this is a good guy, he's a peacemaker, nice, you know, a good world, strong leader, Trump shows his true colors. And we're going to talk about in a few weeks why that happens. That it's this abomination uh, that, that's after three and a half years. Here's a current picture of the Temple Mount. And what you're looking at is the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. And you can see, maybe, maybe you can't see, uh, the people there. This is called the Wailing Wall. Maybe you've seen it. Or, has anybody been there, actually? I know Tom went uh, a few years back and shared with his, his photos. But this is the Wailing Wall, that, you know, the old existing wall from, I believe, the, you know, the Second Temple. But as you look at it, so the, the temple itself would have been you know, that way from the Wailing Wall up towards that big object that's standing up in there. Does anybody know what that big object is with the gold dome on it? Moth. It's a moth. Yeah. It's Muslim, the, the Dome of the Rock. And that's, to them, uh, they, would say, they say or believe that Muhammad ascended into heaven, just as Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives with the disciples. You know, I say Satan is a, is a uh, copycat or an <laughs> imitator. What they say is Muhammad ascended into heaven from that point right there on the Temple Mount. And so when they took control of the Temple Mount area uh, in around five or 600 AD, uh, they built this mosque to commemorate where they say Muhammad ascended into heaven. Of course, there's no history, there's no proof, there's no evidence of, of any of that. But that's a big point of contention now, is there on the holy of holiest places for the Christian world or the followers of Christ, you have this temple mount, or, or I'm sorry, you have this Muslim building structure, you know, you know and uh, Here's another view of it. That's sitting right where it's prophesied there's going to be a temple. Um, and looking at the picture, not that this matters much, this would be a view from the south. So down would be south, up would be north. That Wailing Wall would be over there in the lower left hand corner. And so the Dome of the Rock is sitting right there with a the golden dome on top of it. But I think what history might find out, this is just an opinion is even though it's believed that, and it's pretty common widespread, that, that the Dome of the Rock was built right over the Holy of Holies, I'm not convinced of it. And the reason I say that is there's text in Chronicles that talks about David buying a threshing floor and building that is where he wanted to build the temple and then eventually Solomon, his son, builds it. And if you look what's underneath the Dome of the Rock, and there's, it's open, that surface is very rough. In a threshing floor, you know, you're trying to sort uh, shaft from the wheat, do a big grinding wheel, and those floors are typically smooth. They might have divots and stuff in them, but it's, it's, it's level. What's underneath the dome of the rock is not, and there's indication north of this, still on the Temple Mount, is an old floor of a, a threshing floor. The other thing is there's scripture that hints at the east gate, which would be this gate on the far right hand side points towards the Holy of Holies. And if you look at a map and, and lay that out, that's north of the Dome of the Rock. So I'm not sure, you know, you can't be positive, but I'm not sure that the Dome of the Rock is actually sitting where the Holy of Holies was. I think it may be actually north of there. But that all that said, there is plenty of room for the size of the temple that needs to be built on the existing temple model. Those two could exist side by side. And what I see happening in the end times is you have those two pretty much side by side, the holiest place for the Christians and one of the holiest places for the Muslim existing uh, side by side on the temple mount. Now you might say, when does that happen? 
Does anybody recognize this guy or hear this guy? Gishon and Solomon. You might later on write his name down or take a picture of it or try to remember it. Google him. Uh, very interesting Jewish uh, person. If what he is saying is true, it should make your hair stand on edge. He, uh, I believe he's in his 70s. He might have been born in the late 40s, early 50s, something like that. He fought in the, uh, was it the Six-Day War in 1967, where uh, the Jews were attacked by uh, their, their enemies, <laughs> which is the, the Muslim around them. The Jewish nation came into being in 1948. Miraculous, and we'll talk about that, I think, in future days. But then in 1967, he fought in this war. He was about 19 or so when it happened. But he claims that God spoke to him audibly and said, I want you to rebuild my temple. And he's been working to do that ever since. And you say, okay, how close are we to building a temple? As soon as there's an agreement between Israel and Palestine or Israel and the surrounding Muslim nature, uh, nations, I would say probably less than a week, believe it or not, he could have it built. The building's been prefabricated. It's sitting in various museums in and around Jerusalem. The worship temple uh, ornaments like the, the uh, Manara, the seven candles, that has to be out of one piece of gold and hammered in a certain way. That's built. There are all the, so the, the furnishings, the, the building, that stuff exists already, mostly because of this guy right here. And they're actually training priests, you know, how to carry on the sacrificial rituals of, 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 of doing this on the Temple Mount. The only element that I know that's other than just the peace agreement that's allowed them to build that's left yet would be a blemish-free red heifer. One of the things it talks about in the Old Testament for Temple Mount worship is this uh, blemish-free red heifer. And in the history of Israel, I think there's only been like nine such animals. And by blemish-free, it is like blemish-free. There are no like white hairs, not even one or two. It's red, red. There's two in existence, I believe, right now in Israel. They've been breeding them, trying to produce these red heifers. And one of them, I think, is a candidate, and from, from what I've read, but right now the hair in a certain patch isn't dark enough red to meet the temple standard. But they think, perhaps with age, apparently it's not uncommon for these kind of cows for that hair to darken, in which case it wouldn't be considered. So you think this stuff is far off, and it may be, but it could be really, really close. Now let's talk about the tribulation. And in the tribulation, there's three types of judgments. There is the seal judgment, there's the trumpet judgments, and then there's the bowl judgment. And there's seven of these judgments, each individually, that occurs against the world. What do we say seven represents again? Complete, yeah, yeah. So do I think there's seven literal tribula, or tri tribu literal <laughs> judgments? Yes, but is there a significance to the fact that there's seven, not 10 or 20? I think so. It's just, it's just the, one of the amazing way God works things. It can orchestrate things, okay? Apologize, you aren't gonna be able to read this chart at all. What I've listed is the a real brief synopsis of each of the judgments under each the, the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments, starting at the top, going to the bottom in terms of how they appear in the Bible. Things that make me As it's written, these things fall chronologically. In other words, you have the seal judgments, then you have the trumpet judgments, and then you have the bolt judgments. I'm not so sure they seem either a little bit or a lot. And at a minimum, if you read it, it's like those, I don't know what they're called, these the stacking bowls and stuff. That you, 
you have these stacks of bowls, and then on the last one comes another set, and then you undo them, like things that stack on top. Now the last one comes another set. These judgments are like that, as we'll see. In the Bible, in Revelation, it doesn't flow one through seven. It goes one through six, stops, there's an interlude, it talks about all these different things, and then it goes on to the seventh judgment. It's like, like I said, like stacking bowls. You got six, and then it unpacks it a bit, and you get seven more, and then it goes, and you get to the six, and unpacks it more. But I'm not so sure that these judgments aren't describing one and the same thing, maybe from a different perspective. You know, just like we have the Gospels, you know, if you, when the first time you read the Bible, you read Matthew, then you read Mark, and you go, wait a minute, I've read this before. <laughs> and you read Luke and say, whoa, 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 <laughs> John. Maybe these tri the, the tribulations being described are describing the same thing, or in some cases, overlapping some. To my mind, no one's figured that out completely. And uh, it, it's just an area that in the future, maybe God will enlighten someone. <laughs> And, and you know that'll come to light as to how to interpret that. But keep that in mind. So it's not necessarily uh, all these seven times three or twenty-one judgments in a row. It may be, or it may be on the other end, just seven judgments, and you're seeing it three different ways. Okay. So here again, the tribulation is a seven-year period. Uh, in the middle. Uh, the first half will be just the general tribulation. The second half will be the, the great tribulation as the Bible itself uses that language. Uh, it's the period of God's great wrath. I mean, the first three and a half are going to be bad. The second three and a half are going to be really bad. You don't want to be here. You don't want to be here for any of these. And then the judgments that we're going to talk about for the next three nights, it's easy to get kind of all confused. Where am I <laughs> chronologically? But just keep in mind these judgments we're going to talk about are all during that seven year period. So on the left hand side, from a chronological standpoint, the first thing that happens is this seven year peace agreement. Then we have all these tribulations and it ends in the battle of Armageddon, the second coming of Christ, and then the conclusion of the Armageddon. So it's, it's bookend with this peace agreement on one side and a great war on the other. And in between chapter six to 18, you're going to hear all these horrible things that happen in the tribulation. So here are the events. I'll, I'll play the uh, chapters 6 through 8, eight verse 5, I think, something like that, in a little bit here. But here's what you're going to hear if you haven't read it before, even if you have. So Jesus opens the first six seals, and the tribulation begins. Seals 1 through 4 there are things you can kind of understand. It talks about four horses, and these four horses are different colors, and the first horse is white. Now, it's easy to think, oh, that's Jesus. That's easy to, to pick off. In this case, it's not. I think the symbolism is, isn't, isn't cast towards Jesus. It's cast towards the particular colors. Uh, so be careful of that. Judge five, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, seal judgment, Number five talks about the saints uh, in heaven. Seal six talks about these planetary uh, destruction that takes place. And then, like I say, it doesn't go right on this to, to judgment number seven. It takes like an interlude, and then it talks about these 144,000 sealed on earth, which are 12,000 Israelites from each tribe, uh, with the exception of Dan. And there's a whole story behind Dan. Dan turned the, the, the tribe, I think was one of the first ones to turn to idolatry. And then if you actually take a careful reading of those tribes, it won't be what you'll see in the, the uh, Torah, in the first five books of the Bible. There's some different characters from that tribe, though, that are in there, with the exception of Dan. That, like, family line has been, even though there's also scripture that talks about Dan receiving, the tribe of Dan, receiving their inheritance at the end. So, kind of curious that Dan's excluded here. I don't think that's, I know that's not a mistake in the Bible that is intentional, but the true purpose of that or meaning, I don't know. That's followed with a great multitude in white robes, robes in heaven, and it's, those are those that came out of the Great Tribulation, as it says in Revelation. And then, after that, we get to the, uh, 
seven seal judgment, which talks about this golden censer in heaven with the prayers of the people. In terms of symbolism, uh, the seven seals, uh, it's the scroll of the end time events, which is completely sealed. Only the Lamb of, of God, Christ, uh, can open it. The white horse stands for conquest and great wars to come. The bow is like a battle weapon. The red horse represents killing, bloodshed, war. The black horse is famine, and the pale horse is death. And if you think about that, first you have you know, someone bent on conquest. Then you have the battle, which produces blood. And then after a big battle like this, you have famine. <laughs> Food is hard to find or get. And then you have death. It's a natural sequence. More symbols or symbolic terms that you hear are not necessary. Symbolic terms may be clarified. Hell is the place of the wicked dead. Hades, it's a New Testament uh, use. Uh, it's a Greek word. And that's also the place of the dead. And Sheol, you probably heard that in the Old Testament. That's the Hebrew word. All three of those are similar, or if not the same. So Hades, Sheol, and hell can kind of think of those kind of inter interchangeably. Then we have the abyss, and I don't have a good handle <laughs> as to exactly what that is, other than I know, scripturally speaking, it's different than the other three. It's this bottomless pit. It's the place that Satan and his cohorts are sent to during the millennial period. And so it's different than hell, but how, you know, what is that exactly? I, I can't answer that. And then we have the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the eternal place that those that reject Christ go to. And it talks about this burning sulfur. Okay. Any comments or questions on any of that? Lonnie, do you have a way of monitoring online? You know how to work that if someone has questions? Yeah, it's popping up. We've got several people that are watching. Okay. Um, so, um, it's telling me who's watching. So if I texted Tyler. Tyler said that they can text a question. Yeah. And if I'm watching it, I'll be able to okay. see it and ask you. Once we get all in sync here <laughs> in the future, my plan was is to have Tyler here. He's watching the Colts game. You can tell where his priorities lie. <laughs> <laughs> He's on here. I know. <laughs> Is what like, you he lost one viewer. Mean that, Tyler. But as we talked about, the intent is he, he's going to, as people online listen and watch and have questions, they can bring them up and he'll relay them on to me and then I can respond to them. So if any of you in the future would like to do that, I know some of you have, feel free to, to use that. And hopefully we'll be up and running uh, next time and you can do that. Some more symbolism. Uh, the white robe is symbolizes righteousness and holiness. The 144,000 are the faithful remnant of Israel. And with all this stuff, all these terms, like I said at the beginning of the whole book of Revelation, there's a myriad of interpretation as to what these things mean. Uh, some people view this 144,000 to represent like all the believers of all time. But what I'm showing you is kind of like my slant on it, if you will. I take the 144,000 to be just what God says they are. These are the 144,000 faithful Jewish, you know, from the nation of Israel. Never does God or any of the writers confound the word Israel and those of us from the church. And that's why when I read the text and put text around it, and say, to me, that just sounds like 144,000 Jewish uh, people of faith. And they're going to evangelize the world at the, at the end times. That's their job or what their world is. The golden censer, the censer is this fire pan uh, used to hold hot, hot charcoal. Who was the prophet where uh, there was a seraphim that took a coal and then touched his tongue and purified it? Does that ring a bell? Yeah. But anyway, it's the same sort of symbolism of uh, this, this censer and the hot charcoal. Then incense. Uh, one symbolism of that is our prayers rise and up to God. It's a pleasing owner oh, smell. And, uh, uh, you know, 
kind of get a visual there. Okay, so now I'm going to play chapter 6, uh, 8 through 5. Uh, chapter 6 to chapter 8 through uh, verse 5, if I get my player to, to play it right. That short break, not break, but just general discussions, questions, or comments, or anything we've covered so far. Hey, Mike, in, in, in seven, chapter seven, these uh, these folks who are uh, uh, converted during the Great Tribulation, is that that's the way I'm reading that? That these are folks who are have it come to Christ during the Great Tribulation. Yeah. And have, like it says there, I think it's verse uh, 14. 14 and 15, uh, that they wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. So that would be those people who have accepted Christ during that Great Tribulation, tribulation period. Yeah. Uh, so we will already be gone. Is that right? Is that your. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's my thought too. Yeah. Yeah, I think during the tribulation, there'll be a great uh, come to Jesus <laughs> moment amongst all tribe, tongues, and nations. You either got to go this way or you got to go this way. It won't be so blind and white as before. So, yeah, I expect what the scripture says there's going to be a great multitude of people that come to know Christ and accept Christ during the tribulation. You know, that's so true in our lives, uh, at least for me. Sometimes you need to get like down on your luck or have quite bad times to get refocused or get, you know, God get your attention. Uh, when things go well and we don't have worries or cares in the world, sometimes we think we don't need God and you kind of drift apart versus having times of, of trouble and uh, tribulation for those that are unfortunate to live during that time. We're certainly going to experience that. It sounds to me like um, the hundred and forty-four thousand are the ones that are left to do the work of conversion for the people left that didn't get raptured. So all the Gentiles that are saved or the believers that are in the Gentiles will already have been raptured. Is that that's how I understand. Am I getting anything there? Yes. I just, as I keep saying again and again, it's, it's difficult to see anything that's really definitive. Right. You know, everything is kind of subject to interpretation, but that would be my interpretation as well that uh, the rapture is going to occur prior to the tribulation. Uh, I say how I present, in which case, folks like us wouldn't be there. These would be the Jewish folks, these 144,000, and they become like the three witnesses. Because actually, the world's going to be, at that time, evangelized three times. There'll be two witnesses that we'll talk about, I think, next time. And then you have 144,000, and then there's three angels, two in particular, that you know, promote the good, the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Any others? Another question. The 144 of the uh, uh, nation of Israel, they'll be evangelizing during, during this time. So they would be in verse 9 of chapter 7. These are people that they have converted. Are these people who are these people like us, the church, that I've already been raptured with your thought? I know it's not intended. I would think no, because later on, I think it says these are those that came out of the Great Tribulation. So that would be those that they converted. Okay. Um, unless I'm confusing my verses here. Yeah. Verse 14. John's asking them, you know, who are these people? He said, these are those who have come out of the Great Tribulation, that second three and a half year period. Yeah. So the church would be gone. And so these yeah. are the people that we may have reached these great multitudes. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Now, just to, if I had time, we 
cover all the different viewpoints of how Revelation is interpreted. Those that would interpret this different, one of the viewpoints would be if you go up to chapter 7, verse 4, and says, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. So John hears the numbers who were sealed. He heard, you know, 12,000 from this tribe, those 12,000 from that tribe. And then in verse 9, it says, And then I looked, and what he actually saw was these multitude of people. And so although the, that would say this 144,000 is symbolic, it would say right there, John hears it's 144,000, and then he looks, and it's a multitude of people. I don't interpret that way. I, I think it's 144,000 literal Jewish people that uh, come to Christ and serve as evangelists. And then the next scene or the next you know, verse is John seeing in heaven this week the multitude of people that have been saved. Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Anybody not hear that besides those online? Sorry about that online, folks. Are the multitude and the 144 are the same? No. The, the 144,000 are Jewish uh, people. Who that, are the multitude? The multitude would be the people that they've reached, okay. whether they're Gentile or Jewish. That's what I thought you said in the beginning. And yeah. Asked that yeah. Question, yeah. 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 You know, one thing you'll come across in studying scripture in Christianity, those that would say, well, God treats the Jews just like he does us. And for some doctrine, that's absolutely true. You know, there's only salvation through Christ himself. But God, through scripture, clearly treats Jews different than he does Gentiles. And one thing I would, I would say to that, if you take the Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2, I hold up my Bible. Can you see my Bible? Kind of. This portion right here on the bottom, God, God is primarily speaking to the Jews. That's who that is addressed to. This smaller portion up here, the little skinny portion, that's where it's primarily just addressed to the Gentiles, to the churches, us. And so, you know, that's not a Catch all, be all, but in general, that's the breakdown of the Bible. The bottom part, that's God talking to the Jews specifically, and then the top part, God talking to the Gentiles in the church. And I think I mentioned this the first day that even though the Bible is for us, it's written for us, it's not written to us, it's primarily written to the Jews. And to really understand even you know, the, the tribulation, you have to know what the Jewish culture, you know, words, means, meant to really, you know, get in depth about uh, uh, the, the revelation and the tribulation. Anything else on that section? If not, I'm going to move. We can talk about it. So the next section we're going to uh, listen to would be continuing on with uh, chapter 8, verse 6 through chapter 10. And the events that you're going to hear about here is uh, the trumpet judgments. Uh, and again, you have all these horrible, horrific things that are going to happen. These events taking place on earth, and uh, you can look at them, including this sixth angel. And you may, may not be able to read that, but we're going to hear in Scripture that with the sixth trumpet, uh, there's going to be this uh, great war, and a third of mankind killed, and there's going to be 200 million troops. And that's one of the reasons when I, when I read through the tribulation, I think there's perhaps a duplication of uh, descriptions, because to me, the sixth trumpet judgment war sounds a lot like Armageddon. You know, when you, when you read the second book of Revelation, you hear about this 200 million man army that comes and invades Israel. If you take a position that the, the uh, judgments, the seal and the trumpet and the bowls are all sequential, then there's two wars. There's this one, which is the sixth 
angel trumpet judgment, which is, leads to a great war. And then there's also Armageddon that we're going to talk about in great length in the days coming. I'm inclined to think that maybe this is one and the same war. Could, could be, it could be. I mean, it could be and it could not be. But just kind of keep that in mind as, as you listen to it. And then there's going to be a chapter here on the angel of the little scroll. Some of the uh, symbolism in terms, definitions of trumpet. Throughout the Bible, the trumpet is used to announce important events, as is, you know, the, these judgments. There's a term called wormwood that's used to talk about things turn bitter, and it's a plant that makes, has a bitter taste to it, and it causes, you know, death, those that are drinking the water. Then we're going to look at this thing uh, of locust. I have another slide, I think, in here of specifically the locust, uh, maybe another interpretation of, of what those are. But biblically speaking, locusts have always been like a sign of God's judgments against man, whatever form that may be. Apollyon is this uh, uh, evil spirit that rules over uh, the, the, the dark regions. Some interpret Apollyon to be Satan. So you kind of keep that in mind too when you, when you listen to that. And it talks about four angels bound at the Euphrates. The Euphrates River, which uh, at some point I'll show you a, a map again, which would be uh, like north of Syria, starts in Turkey, then flows the north side of Syria, then down to Iran into the Persian Gulf. Plays a role, and the, the Revelation talks about the Euphrates River drying up, or being dried up, so that this 200 million man army can come across into Egypt. And there again, I think that these judgments, these three different types of judgments uh, overlap because two of them talk about this Euphrates River being dried up. It's just strange that they're not talking about one of the same event. Uh, the mystery of God, the fact that God is one over evil and will reign uh, forever. Okay. Let me turn to Revelations chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. I'm just going to read that to you. Now, when the Bible in Revelation here when it speaks of locust, it may be a literal locust, maybe that kind of thing. But look at that picture of an attack helicopter. <laughs> and let me just read to you what the text says. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rush, rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had the power to torment people for five months. Now, I'm not saying that this, in fact, is an you know, Apache helicopter, but you see that kind of symbolism. John, in his day, you know, 95 AD or thereabouts, wouldn't have seen anything like this in his life, so maybe he's describing it as a locust. Kind of looks like a locust. It's going to cause pain. It had this sound of horses rushing into battle. You know, when you hear a helicopter, it's very distinctive. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Maybe, it, maybe it's a literal locust. Maybe it's not. But you have this sort of symbolism that, that comes into play uh, in Revelation. And sometimes it's difficult to sort out exactly what it is. I don't see any hair. What's that? I don't see any hair <laughs> or teeth. Yeah, perhaps. You got the wrong helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> I take the hair to be like the blades of the helicopter itself, the long flowing hair. It's you know like hair. It could have teeth. You know, it doesn't have to be this helicopter. But just think of some type of helicopter. Maybe it's a drone. But you know, it does I don't know. Why would they torment people for five months, though? A helicopter. Yeah. 
I don't know. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying this is exactly it, but it's that kind of thing in here. What I know about locusts, though, is when a locust bites, not a locust, a scorpion bites, I think that, that, that pain inflicted lasts for five months. So when they say five months, <laughs> there's something there. I don't know if it's literal or if it's figurative. So now let me play for you uh, the rest of chapter 8 and uh, 9 and 10. Comments or questions regarding that section of text or anything we've talked about tonight? I have a good question. Um, it talks about steel for them, it's only 4,000. We don't know what that steel is. We know what the mark of the beast is. But you don't have any clues as to what that seal would be for them? No, I don't know. Nor have I read or come across anything that would suggest what it is. Has anybody else seen anything that would indicate what that seal is for the, the believers? No. There's a lot of things that God hasn't told us yet. A lot of little things, a lot of big things. But uh, no, I, I don't. Sorry. Anyone else? Lonnie, were there questions online? Did I see you writing, or is that something else? Um, no, there's no questions online. Okay. Or at least they just posted it if they knew how. Okay. I have another question. Sure, yeah, that's why we're here. Earlier, it was he had seen. Uh, where the multitude of the white robed people in heaven were told to uh, delay a little longer. And then here in uh, the 10th chapter, I think it said the delay won't be any longer, but we don't have an idea what, like if he released those or what. Yeah, I think the original one would be where God is saying, He's trying to get as many people as possible to turn to him. Okay. And then the second one, again, these, these things are, you know, throughout the whole tribulation where God says, okay. Oh, okay. The, the, the period of grace is about to shut. Okay. No yes. more delay. Yeah. All those that are going to turn to me, I'll give them every possible chance to turn to me. That's how I turn. That makes sense. Thank you. So I heard. It's it's hard to understand because there's so much symbolism there to know. You know, we want to know precisely when did this happen, when did that happen, who did what's involved, and it's it's veiled in the symbolism. But uh, there's enough of the details there to know that this is a horrible, horrible yeah. time. And you don't want any part of it. You can avoid it. Do you, do you think like physical things that they describe about describe? Here, John does about a third of the sun being struck, a third of the stars losing their their, their life. Do you think that's an actual physical um, you know, thing that's going to happen? Or do you think there's symbolism in that? I don't know. I, don't know. I think it's a literal thing that's going to happen, but you know, there's so much symbolism. You know, you just think about that, because what the sun does for the earth, and a third of that power is gone. It's got to affect everything. Yeah. yeah. And you don't know if, for instance, if Armageddon involves nuclear war, and there's a lot of dust and clouds in the air, yeah. and so now a third of the sun coming in is no longer penetrate. Yeah. You can't see the moons and the stars because it's, the sky is black. Yeah. Or if it literally means God's going to do away or allow it to be done away with a third of these planets in the sun. I don't know. Yeah. I have heard that. I have kind of heard that possibility too, where the destruction could be from us. You have this confused look on your face, Mike. Is there something there? No, I was I was thinking this is probably more of the back in chapter 20, but 
this is probably too far ahead. In fact, we were just talking about last night what the intervention that would look like for the believer. Um, and in Michelle and I were actually having a conversation last night. If you ask forgiveness for your sins, and it talks about those being farther than the east is from the west, and I'll remember them no more, we were just curious what might be judged for the believer. The believers were both in the Bema Seat judgment, which is the judgment of Christ. And it won't be for like bad things we've done. Those are forgiven. Those are Christ's blood has done away with those as far as east is from the west. Our judgment will be for rewards. Okay. You know, Mr. Christian and Mrs. Christian. Here's the things that I've given you, all these resources and abilities. What have you done with them? And it'll be a rewards. For those that are non-believers, it's a punishment. But we'll talk about that coming up in, in, in a lot more detail when we talk about ju judgment of us, you know, like the great white throne and the BBC judgment. Does anybody have anything else you want to add, either to that or anything else? I think it's a question a lot of believers have. <laughs> yeah. Is what, the, what their own judgment will look like. Yeah. And then there's a question does it all occur at once? Is, is everybody judged at the end time, or is there like a dispensationalism of, of, of judgment? I tend to believe there's going to be a judgment period at the end of time when all this rolls out. But there's others that would disagree with that. And you can back it up with scripture, kind of both ways. Can you talk a little longer? Uh, Sandra Box says that she can't hear. Can't but, hear me? Yeah. I don't know if there's something that she needs to click on. So, um, I don't know if she can hear me. Sa Sandra, can you hear me? Sandra Bach? Fox. Is she going to church? Yeah. yeah. Sonny and Donovan? Yeah, you say hi to him. It's great to hear from her. Hopefully, she can hear me. Hello? <laughs> I cannot hear. Oh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what to do about that. Well, sometimes you have to restart it and the video and start again. If it's going through Facebook. Right. Yeah. I'm not a Facebook user at all, so I plead ignorance. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. Uh, anything else? Why did he eat this scroll? Was that a question from somebody out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was told to eat the scroll to internalize it. And you know, God's word is sweet to you, so it tastes like honey. But then when you realize, or John realized what it actually had to say and what was to come, it, you know, just like you feel so bad because there are gonna be so many people that are gonna be hurt in so many ways. And not just remote people that we don't know, but it'll be our family, our friends, and people that we've tried to reach for years and years. That, you know, and so that's gonna be a very, Sweet, it's God's word, but it's also bitter at the same time, and it sours your stomach because you know what's coming, and you know it's final. Okay? Mike, did you say that's the B seat judgment? Bema seat? What did you call it? B-E-M-A, Bema seat judgment of Christ. Yeah, you have the Bema seat, and then you have the white throne judgment of God. And then, as I mentioned before, a whole lot of things, we're going to judge angels. <laughs> Debbie's going, I ain't going to do that. <laughs> yeah. And Tyler and I were talking the other night. Interesting thing about angels and the spiritual world. Nowhere in Scripture is there any indication that angels are extended grace and forgiveness like we are through Christ. There is no body or person that can take our place for angels, at least it's not in scripture, like we do, you know, this huge, huge, <laughs> eternal, thankful thing that we have for Christ. Angels, it's not in scripture. Now, whether or not that's one of those things that God just hasn't told us, or if that's how it is, I don't know. That makes you go, hmm, as well. Okay. 
Final thoughts for tonight. And that is, even if we're not here in the tribulation, we as followers of Christ are going to have trials and tribulations. We can expect it. You know, I think sometimes on TV you see, you hear and see these feel-good pastures of, you know, everything is, is wonderful and it's a bed of roses. But actually to, to, to follow Christ, you can expect that Satan is going to be there and he's going to come for you. He's going to attack you and bad things are going to happen. Uh, but I would say to that, stay strong in your faith, you know, uh, and one way of doing that that I highly, highly encourage and recommend is study and read your Bible. Uh, when I'm, I myself, I know when I start to get, I, I struggle with anger at times, and when I know when I have these bits of anger and feel kind of hurt, it's like, when's the last time I read the Bible? And then I know when I go back into the Word, it just kind of like soothes things out, and I see the big picture again, and it helps me. So. Stay in the Bible, you know, read, study it. Uh, it it's, it's the fountain we need to, be, to, to drink from. And the other thing I encourage you to do as you're doing tonight <laughs> is to stay in the fellowship with other believers, whether that's attending studies like this, but certainly to be part of a church and certainly, certainly to be an active part of it, to get plugged in. Don't just be a, a pew sitter, <laughs> but, you know, be part of the church, dig in. And uh, God will reward that. And of course, the last thing would be better days are ahead for all of us, regardless of our lot in life, regardless of our trials and tribulations. It's going to be worth it. Someday it's really going to be worth it. So hang in there. So with that, let me close in prayer and then we'll close for now. Father God, we know through, uh, through Jesus that, uh, in fact, someday it's going to be worth it. And uh, Father, Although we don't look forward to trials and tribulations, uh, we know to expect it. Uh, we just pray that when uh, hard times come our way, that uh, we hold on tight to Christ. We hold on tight to you, uh, knowing that uh, you'll see us through and that your ways are best. The past that we uh, perhaps envision are of our own, and that you can see uh, the end game and you can guide us there. And so, Father, we just ask to give us the strength to lean on your understanding and not our own. And help us, Lord, to stay strong in that faith. Help us to be uh, in your word steady. Help us to uh, be active in our church here, active in, uh, in, in being about your work. And Father, we ask that you keep us safe until next week, keep the COVID at bay for, for all of our community, for all of the world. Uh, that we may be here again next week and continue on your work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.